Today's video is brought to you by Conflict of Nations, the free online PvP strategy game. Thanks to them for sponsoring, I'll tell you more about them in a bit. It's said to be a ship with no equal, a naval innovation on a scale and size that would eclipse the best fleets of the world. Envisioned as an aircraft supercarrier with all the cutting edge technology of the 21st century and its own fleet of fifth generation aircraft, it is said to be the antidote to Russia's aging naval fleet and a new era in Russia's claim to global hegemony. Its name is Storm, a proposed class of nuclear aircraft carrier that would rival anything that the West has produced, if not exceed it. If it can be built, it will change the game on the global balance of naval might. If it can't, then it will be condemned as the latest in a long line of post-Soviet superweapons meant more to stroke the Russian oligarchy's collective ego than actually kick any tangible amount of NATO But Either way, it's certainly worth finding out, so let's jump in. If you've watched our recent video on the Admiral Kuznetsov, Russia's only currently functioning aircraft carrier, and let us be clear that functioning is a bit of an undeserved compliment there, then you already know how badly Russia's fleet is in need of an upgrade. By the way, if you haven't watched that video, then I would recommend that you do, but keep watching this one, I need that watch time. But look, for now, just bear in mind that when we talk about the Admiral Kuznetsov, we're talking about an aircraft carrier with a ski jump slope to chuck aircraft into the air, sometimes while running on steam power and being escorted around by a little tugboat because of how often it breaks down. It's, uh, it's not exactly impressive. It's also spent the last five years in dry dock, so there's also that. Now, this should all probably make it clear just how badly Russia would like to replace the Admiral Kuznetsov and get something a little bit more competent out onto the high seas. And the answer, or at least a concept of an answer, came by surprise in 2015 when the Krylov State Research Center of St. Petersburg announced that they had developed a new generation of aircraft carrier design. So if you're a fan of World War II and military strategy games, then Conflict of Nations is absolutely for you. It's an online game where you can choose a real country to lead in modern global warfare. You can fight up to 128 other players in real-time battles that can take weeks to complete. You build your army with tons of different units from tanks to nuclear submarines. And the best part, you can declare war on your neighbors or forge alliances with other players. It's up to you to choose your own strategy and just take over the world. One thing I love about Conflict of Nations is the long-term strategy involved. You really have to plan ahead if you want to come out on top, and the fact that you can play with the same account on both PC and mobile is a huge plus. Like, I'm a busy dude, I like to game on the go, but sometimes I find a little time at the computer as well, so that's nice. Plus, if you click in the description below, you'll get an exclusive gift of 13,000 gold and one month premium subscription for free, but that's only available for the next 30 days. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below, choose your country, fight your way to victory. Thanks to Conflict of Nations for sponsoring, and now the rest of today's video. Designated Project 23000E, or STORM, the concept was presented to the public for the first time at Russia's International Maritime Defense Show. In advance of the presentation, the craft's designers took to the media to describe the project with far more specificity than one would typically expect for a piece of advanced technology in its development phases. The Storm class carrier was described at an overall length of 330 meters, almost exactly the size of an American Nimitz class or Gerald R. Ford class aircraft carrier. It would also displace a similar amount of tonnage at approximately 90,000 to 100,000 tons at a similar width of 40 meters and a similar crew size somewhere between four and 5,000 officers and enlisted sailors. With a top speed of 30 knots and a cruising speed of 20, the storm was supposed to be able to handle 120 days at sea and withstand rough conditions with the potential to use either conventional power or a nuclear reactor to move across the seas. Not only uh, would all of this be a massive improvement for Russia already, but the ship's air power uh, would be a game changer of its own with a complement of 80 to 90 deck aircraft. More recent claims by Russian media include that a carrier version of Russia's Su-57 Felon fighter aircraft would make up a 
majority of the carrier's fight or wing, complemented by modified MiG-29 jets. The carrier also includes room for naval helicopters and early warning aircraft. The deck is angled to include four positions from which planes can be launched to ski jump ramps similar to the Admiral Kuznetsov and two electromagnetic catapult systems. For purposes of self-defense, the carrier is said to include an anti-torpedo suite and four anti-aircraft missile systems, along with cutting-edge electronics and communication support. Now, all of these developments, unified into a single carrier, would be enough to put Russia back on the map in terms of naval competition. And importantly, the Storm design wasn't for a single carrier at all, but an entire class of supercarriers with which Russia could project power all across the world. For a nation that was, at the time, fresh off a successful invasion of Crimea, the storm was a sign of military optimism as much as it was an indicator of Russia's long-term aspirations and their hopes to re-enter direct naval competition with the West. Of course, all this early grandstanding and excitement wasn't for no reason. After all, sensitive data about complex military machines doesn't exactly get given away like candy. All that is, uh, unless you're going out of your way to catch the world's eye, and as it turns out, that's exactly what Russia hoped to do. Much like the aforementioned Su-57 fighter jet and the T-14 Armata tank, which we've also covered on this channel, we get through a lot, the storm was designed with export customers in mind alongside the Russian military. The big offer came in July of 2016, when Russia made an overture to the Indian Navy weeks in advance of a meeting between India and the United States, which, you guessed it, was about cooperating on aircraft carrier technology. The offer included a few key details that inform where Russia was with the carrier at that time. It was offered at a price tag of 5.5 billion US dollars, and it was projected to take 10 years to build, most likely meaning 10 years from the time that the contract was signed. India has had its sights set on a nuclear aircraft carrier for years, and most likely took the Russian design seriously for a couple of reasons. First, Russia had already assisted India by overhauling and modernizing a prior aircraft carrier, and second, the US offer to India did not include nuclear propulsion technology, whereas the Russian one did. However, we now know with hindsight that India did not choose to pursue the Storm class design, probably in part because it would have been a massively unnecessary expenditure, given India's lack of a need to actually project supercarrier levels of international power, and probably in part because of its ridiculous price tag. Not only that, but a big part of India's interest in supercarriers in the first place was in order to learn how to build them indigenously, and outsourcing to a foreign partner just wouldn't provide that same benefit, even if the result was more affordable than the Storm class. India was also in the position to choose between one offer from the US by people who actually knew how to build supercarriers and one from Russia, whose engineers had never actually attempted anything of the sort before. And finally, India's interest in the United States as a partner wasn't accidental either. India has been in the process of distancing itself militarily from Moscow for years, and although the Storm class was every bit the traditional Russian superweapon that appeals to its own leaders, I would be willing to bet that the timing, scale, and price tag of the proposal might have been a bit tone deaf to India's actual needs and budget as a military partner. And uh, Mega Projects arms dealer tip of the day, try to meet your customers where they're at, all right? So, look, the India deal didn't actually end up happening, but a little bit of rejection never stopped the Russian military industrial complex before, and it sure as hell wasn't going to do so with the storm. The design received a few major modifications in the next few years, most prominently the decision to equip the storm class with nuclear reactors rather than relying on conventional fuel. The reactor, the RITM-200, was already in development by the time the storm was announced, and it was scheduled for a test aboard the icebreaker Artika in order to show proof of concept. As of now, that ship has been commissioned successfully and is the largest and most powerful nuclear icebreaker ever constructed, so, well, good news for the reactor design and for the storm carrier. However, there were also myriad issues with the prospect of actually building a first carrier, not least the need to figure out, well, where to actually build it. The most likely existing candidate would have been the Sevmas shipyards, but even that facility would have needed major upgrades and expansion to be able to handle such a giant ship. Not only that, but the optimism of Russia's military landscape in 2015 deteriorated over the next few years as a broader economic collapse precipitated far greater conservatism in Russian military thinking by necessity. In 2017, Russian President Vladimir Putin officially postponed the construction of the storm until after 2025 in an effort to shore up Russia's existing navy first. 
And to make matters worse, the Russian push for a supercarrier came at the same time as the rest of the world began to figure out that supercarriers might not actually be the way into the future. It's counterintuitive in the same way that battleship obsolescence would have seemed counterintuitive before World War II. After all, a bigger ship means more planes, and more planes means more air superiority. Just like a bigger battleship means bigger guns, which means bigger explosions on your enemy's ship. But look, in reality, even the United States might cap its new Ford-class carrier fleet at four ships, because to the US's dismay, anti-carrier weapons have just come too far, too fast. These are weapons like China's so-called carrier killer anti-ship missile, or Russia's own Kinzhal hypersonic missile, which have been designed with supercarrier busting in mind. And it's not likely that a Russian design would be any better at dealing with those particular issues than an American design. The kind of human and financial devastation that comes with a sunk supercarrier would cast a shadow over any major power, and given the fact that any Russian supercarrier would still have to square up to 11 times its own power in direct confrontation with the United States, carrier buster missiles might be the least of Russia's worries. By 2020, the design for the Storm class carrier was ready for evaluation by the Russian military in hopes that it would be chosen for production. But even then, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shogu oh, was himself becoming skeptical of the need for aircraft carriers and other tools of international force projection for any other purpose than just keeping up with the United States, China, India, and the European Union. However, Putin himself appeared to have no such reservation, and given that the Storm class design's major competitor, the Lamantin, was clearly being marketed as a cheaper and lower end alternative, uh, we could take a guess at which one caught Putin's eye. An issue of where to design the ship had also gotten, well, if not a solution, at least a second option. Shipyards located in Crimea, which was by this point firmly in Russia's control. And the Russian Prometheus class S 500 hypersonic surface to air missile system, which has since been deployed, is rumored to have been added to the Storm class design. But if you've kept up with our recent series on Russian military designs, you can probably already see our final complication coming, and that is, of course, Ukraine. No matter what Putin's personal optimism around the Storm class carrier might have been in 2020, he and his ministers were already working in a situation where Western sanctions imposed after the annexation of Crimea and the low-grade Russian-supplied insurgency in Ukraine's Donbass region were getting in the way of Russia's ability to access high-tech equipment while tanking the Russian economy overall. But however difficult those sanctions might have been for Russia to handle, they were nothing compared to the size and scope of what came after the 2022 invasion of Ukraine. At present, Russia's military and its broader economy have clearly demonstrated a lack of ability to source advanced resources and intellectual property from Western suppliers in the face of those sanctions. Even if that weren't an issue, the Russian economy is not equipped to handle both a war in Ukraine and global isolation, while also developing and building new weapon systems. And while we obviously don't know what Russia's place on the international stage will be after the invasion of Ukraine reaches its end, but given their global status as an emerging pariah state, it's hard to imagine a Russia that could endeavor to take on supercarrier-sized levels of military development spending any time soon. It's become a lot clearer recently just how correct Western analysts were about the Storm class ship. It's been dismissed as a Russian pipe dream for about half a decade now by many Western observers. Although it's unclear just how much of the timing of Russia's design proposal was specifically to court India as a single international export customer, it's not unreasonable to assume that even the early design phases were contingent on foreign money to make the whole endeavor happen. Now it's all but certain that Russia couldn't produce the Storm class carrier without a whole lot of cash and technology that it just doesn't have. The list of countries with the will and ability to provide that is, well, zero. And it's unlikely that any export customers will emerge anytime soon either. At this point, we could take the entire European Union and other NATO countries off the table, along with India, which clearly isn't interested in the product. South Korea is indigenously producing its own carrier. Thailand, Japan, Egypt, Australia, and Algeria all seem content with their own fixed and rotary wing aircraft carriers for now. And Brazil just sunk its rusted and decommissioned aircraft carrier off the Atlantic coast, which doesn't really relate to the situation, but it's still a fun fact that we felt that we should share. China despite its recent willingness to cooperate with Russia post-Ukraine invasion, appears to be handling its own aircraft carrier in-house. So, 
with no foreign infusions of money, no shipyards currently in a state to build a supercarrier, none of the required cash to build it indigenously, serious gaps in the needed technology, and the Admiral Kuznetsov carrier still acting dopey as hell in its dry dock, we feel comfortable in declaring the Storm Class carrier is pretty dead in the water. Despite an impressive initial design, a list of specifications that were put on par with American and other advanced carriers, and a deadbeat older sibling in the Admiral Kuznetsov that badly needs some kind of replacement, the Storm has proved to be the wrong design at the wrong time for Russia's needs, as well as the needs of its international partners. Perhaps the situation will change years in the future, when the memory of Russian wars of aggression don't sting quite so badly as they do today. But then, it's likely that the carrier buster technology of tomorrow will be developed or even deployed, and if that's the case, the storm is most likely staying on the shelf forever. Thanks again to Conflict of Nations for sponsoring today's video. Real-time battles, diverse units, the ability to forge alliances or declare war, all of that is available. Just click the link in the description below, and thanks for watching.